All right, welcome back everybody to our professional interview series for the Parks and Rec uh, interview series. Today we have uh, Dr. Matt, Dr. Matt Durden. Uh, Dr. Durden, how are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here and chat with you a little bit. Did, did, did I say your last name right? Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah, nicely done. Yeah, I accept various pronunciations and that's one <laughs> of the more uh, uh, on point uh, ones. So that was great. Well, you know, it's, fu it's funny is I've got the, like the most vanilla boring last name that you could have, right? And people still mispronounce it. I'm like, this is pretty common here, you know? <laughs> you know White, Smith, Bradley, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Durg, where, where, are you, where are you at now and what do you do? So I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of Experience Design and Management in the Marriott School of Business at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. That was like a long, uh, answer to that question yeah so i'm in provo utah and that's and that's where i teach um and w so just kind of give a brief explanation of what kind of courses you teach and what kind of stuff you do there i guess sure yeah so um i teach courses in what we call experience design so definitely some similarities with like a like a rec programming class which is what i taught when i was at texas a&m as a faculty member and I'm trying to think if i did that as a grad student as well. But anyway, so I taught the programming class and then that sort of evolved over time where I bring in a lot of design thinking and we look at um, uh, experience design across a variety of contexts. So some students of mine will go into a traditional sort of parks and rec uh, experience industry, hospitality, tourism, that type of space. Um, but I also have a lot of students who will go into customer experience or employee experience. So it's sort of taking those principles and then and applying them across different contexts. So I teach that to all of our undergraduates and then I teach a, a version of that class in the MBA program in our business school as well. Okay. Oh, very cool. Well, um, before we start, and I wanna ask you more about that because I think that's a unique program, right? And, um, but before we get down to that, let's kind of travel in the, in the time machine backwards a little bit. And um, could you tell us about where you're from, where you grew up, what kind of stuff you did and how you got interested in the world you did? Yeah, sure. Um, so coming back to BYU was, was coming home. I'm from Provo originally. So I grew up here um, and sort of spent half my time in Utah growing up and, and then the other portion in California and Idaho. Not that I moved to those places, but my family still operates a whitewater rafting outfitting company. And so I grew up, um, you know, starting about 14 guiding in California and Idaho on, on uh, one up to seven day uh, whitewater trips. And so commercial recreation was sort of just part of, of growing up. And as I, especially on our like extended day trips in Idaho, I would um, notice changes in people over the course of a couple of days, which is pretty interesting, right? You'd see uh, relationships form among strangers really quickly, right? And you'd hear people talk about how those relationships and friendships, you know, lasted long after they were on the river or even family dynamics change. Um, and so just from the perspective of trying to provide these experiences as a guide, I started thinking about, you know, what was it about this particular experience that led to, you know, I think observable changes that, you know, a, a teenager picked up on. And um, so, you know, I started thinking, is it, the, is it the setting? Is it the nature of the activity sort of challenge and sort of the risk involved? Is it just being disconnected from society? So these are just questions that I had, mainly in terms of how can we provide a better experience for people coming on our, on our trips. And, in, in terms of school, I always loved school, but I, I really struggled to uh, get a sense of what I wanted to do and, and what a career path would be for me. And so that was a that was a really sort of a struggle. I was sort of like I'm in, I could I think I could be interested in anything, but I, I just struggled to know what that was. And so I thought about law school and I thought about a variety of things. Anyways, my um, dad had put together trips for kids with mental and physical disabilities just on the side. We had a little nonprofit connected to the river company and I hadn't really done a, a lot with it. Um, it had been sort of his deal, but he asked me um, 
while I was, uh, you know, still finishing up my undergrad, if I'd help put together one of these trips and I said, yeah, sure. I'd be, you know, that sounds interesting. And, and in the process of sort of trying to find a population of kids to work with, I had a friend who I guided with who connected me with a recreation management professor at BYU where I, I was doing my undergrad. And, um, and his name was Mark Widmer, and I didn't know anything about the recreation management program. I was a German literature major with minors in history and business. Like I was just sort of all over the place. Um, anyway, so I went and met with Mark and um, he had guided in California where I had done some guiding as well on the on the American River, the South Fork of the American River. And um, anyways, he said, he said, yeah, I mean, that that sounds really cool. Um, you know, putting together a, you know, a trip like this, he goes, I've also really wanted to, um, you know, run some type of program for disadvantaged kids and um, conduct research on the impact of outdoor experiences on this population. Would you guys be interested in working with us on something like that? And um, those conversations um, led to a camp called uh, Camp Wild that we had all of these things just sort of fall into place that um, we got some funding through a university donor and we're, uh, my wife and I ended up managing and, and running this program uh, for three summers up in Idaho. And it was this opportunity to bring undergraduate students who served as a staff and then faculty who were doing the research. And as I got to know more about the, the research and working with academics like Mark and Stacey Taniguchi and Brian Hill and others, um, you know, it, it sort of all of these sort of pieces of things that I, I was interested in came together. And I had this realization, it was really this moment we were, we were actually, we had taken undergrad students to California to do some uh, training on the river and do some program development there before we ran the actual program for the kids. And Mark was, uh, we were at this campground and he had his laptop out on a picnic table and he was talking to the students about self-efficacy theory which is sort of our primary um, framework we we're using to develop the program and also the research and just like in this moment i'm like this is it like this is what i want to do this combines like so many things i'm interested in so on the on the drive back from california uh, I just quizzed him and and Stacey Taniguchi, one of the other faculty members. I'm like, okay, so tell me about this academic thing and tell me about like, like, and they had a master's program. So I'm like, what's the master's program? How do I get in? And they're like, well, the application period was like a couple of weeks ago and you got to take the GRE, but we might be able to get you in. So I came home and took the GRE like the next Wednesday and a petition to get into the program late and started the program that fall and i remember uh going to like the first day of class and telling my wife we had been married about a year at this point um like i'm i i like i'm really excited about this but i still really have no idea <laughs> what, what it is and what i'm doing but it just felt like this was a this was a path um that would be a, a fit for me and 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 that focus on experiences and trying to understand and unpack experiences is what has been sort of the through line for my my career. So uh, from, I did my master's at BYU and then I went to Texas A&M and worked with Peter Witt um, and uh, did my PhD there, stuck around there for a couple of years as a faculty member, then came back to BYU about nine years ago. So you, you mentioned uh, Texas A&M as far as your PhD goes. Uh, so when, when you're looking at different programs, what, what drew you to, so you talked about what drew you to where you're at for your master's, your undergrad. So what drew you to the program there in Texas for your PhD? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it was also a, like a specific moment that I remember we had a grad lab at BYU for the all the graduates. And so I had walked in the lab one day and I had the little post-it board with announcements. And there was just a the printout that there was a, a doc assistantship at a and uh, working with Peter Witt and there was funding. And so I asked Mark, I'm like, do you know this guy? And he goes, oh yeah, I, like I met him before I'll send him an email anyway. So he connected me with, with Peter. And at the time my research, you know, because of this camp, 
uh, my thesis was looking at the impact of uh, challenging outdoor uh, recreation on identity development among adolescents, and we were doing some other self-efficacy stuff. So my my primary focus at that point was was adolescents, and this was a, a you know a research assistantship focused on youth development, and um, you know I I knew of Peter Witt, right? Um, so I. I Based upon that, I had a conversation with Peter. Um, I had also, uh, Peter and Linda's book, their their uh, youth development book had come out fairly recently. And so I reached out to Linda as well, and those were the two uh, places I applied. And then it was sort of a back and forth trying to decide what would be the best fit. I mean, there's like two great schools, two great faculty members to work with. Um, and ultimately we ended up uh, uh, choosing to go to a &M, and it was just really a wonderful experience. Great school, great, and just, uh, Peter Witt was just a wonderful mentor. And, I, and I'll say this to people all the time that are interested in grad school. In my opinion, it's 80% the advisor and 20% the program, right? The, the advisor is the person who will, who will make or break your experience. And so if you have someone like, you know, Peter Witt, who is really committed to mentoring his students and providing them resources and helping them, you know, do interesting research and get access to data. Um, it's, it's an awesome experience. So it's a little bit different than like an undergrad, like where am I going to go to school? And you're thinking about the school, like, at least for me, in my opinion, it flips a little bit with grad school. It's like, who do I want to work with? Who's doing research that's interesting to me? Um, who have I, you know, have I, am I able to talk to former students of this person, what do they say about their experience? So it really becomes more about the person you work with. Sorry, my button wasn't unmuting me. Um, had a train pass by, so I had to put myself on mute. Oh, no worries. Um, no, and I think you're absolutely right. I remember when, when I was looking at PhD programs as well as I had a couple different opportunities uh, before me. And that's really what came down to is, you know, who, who I think is going to set me up as far as, you know, mentor me and set myself up uh, for my future. So I think that's some good advice. Um, how, how long were, how, I know you spent some time at A&M even after you completed your doctorate there, um, you know, as a faculty member. So mm -hmm. how long, how long were you there uh, all together? And then, um, you know, what, tell me about a, an awesome experience you had while you were there. Um, so I was there for six years, so th three years. So I did master's in two at BYU, and then I did my doc in three at A&M. And then after it was, it was uh, 2009, so it was right during the um, sort of recession and an uh, interesting time to interview. So I had a, I had a bunch of uh, interviews and actually ended up with a, a couple of um, offers, luckily enough, and thought we were really sure we were going to take um, – one of the two that that we got and then Peter came back and said hey I've got some money to do a postdoc to to develop this youth development initiative which was really sort of a research to practice center at AM to disseminate um, youth development research and best practices out to practitioners and that was really appealing to me and and it, at the time it felt a little bit counterintuitive because I like turned down a tenure track position to take a postdoc. But, um, you know, as, as my wife and I thought about it and sort of prayed about it and tried to figure out like what was the best thing for our family, we decided to stay and it turned into really an awesome project. And it actually, the, we had so much success from the postdoc, we were able to leverage that to get additional funding from the university to turn that into a faculty position, um, the director of the initiative um, and then I was in that position for two more years. And so I'd say that I'll, I'll just two, two experiences at a and I think that were really signature for me was um, one, being able to, to um, direct this youth development initiative. Um, I, I think I was really motivated. Another thing that drew me to the, this field was that it felt applied, right? That I wouldn't just be doing research that would never have some type of impact, but that I could do stuff that would actually be of worth to people. And so I love the youth development initiative because it was continuously thinking about, okay, how do we translate research into practice? And then I get us, I, I got to spend a lot of time on the road traveling around Texas, 
working with different youth organizations and also at the state level, just thinking about, yeah, like how do we do youth development work better? And so I, those, those three years have been really impactful for me because I think it's just given me a mindset of like, okay, so what when it comes to research and what like also just, I think teaching practitioners, they're not, they, they, they're just like cut to the chase. Like, just tell me what I need to do. Don't give me a bunch of fluff. And I think that's helped me in my teaching too. Um, and then I was just going to say quickly, like my research experience um, at a and I, I, I got connected through Peter again. This is the advisor that he had a nonprofit come to him and say, you know, we're looking for somebody to do some evaluation work for us. And Peter was always quick to involve grad students. He goes, this seems like a great project. You want to get involved. And um, I ended up, I, I actually still do work with this nonprofit. They do international immersion experiences for adolescents all over the world. And then, and then more recently they started doing stuff for wounded veterans and just, just a really cool group of people. So I, I worked with them and collected data over about a year's period of, um, of kids that were traveling, you know, all over the world to different locations, but we we're also able to collect data like before they travel, during travel, after travel. So we got this, this really cool longitudinal data set and we we're able to look at questions related to how does uh, sort of social, like the relationships within the program impact uh, outcomes. Um, this program had like a, a, a prep program that the teachers ran in the schools and then they traveled and then they came back home so we we're able to look at what's the individual contribution of sort of this indirect learning experience you know learning about the great amazonian rainforest and then traveling to the rainforest and how do those two experiences contribute uniquely to outcomes and so that was just an awesome really cool project of doing something where i was pulling out data that I could publish in academic journals, but I still had to turn around and translate that for the nonprofit to say, here's what matters and here's we're answering questions you're interested in. So I think both of those experiences really um, cemented for me the importance of, of, of applied research. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And it's, uh, sounds like, it just sounds like an incredible experience, right? Uh, as you're sitting here talking about it, I'm a little bit jealous. Um, the, yeah, I feel uh, really grateful. A and M did did me right. It's a it's an awesome program. No, and, and you know, and, and you you come from a long list of in, incredible folks that have come from that program, right? And I think that speaks a lot uh, that you know their graduates, uh, masters and PhD level have gone on and done a lot. Um, so it speaks a lot yeah. to the program. Um, so at some point, uh, you get the opportunity to move back home. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, that opportunity and that decision-making process and uh, walk us through that? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, wasn't a, that wasn't an easy decision. I mean, we had, uh, when I got the, the faculty position after the postdoc, we bought a home. We're like, okay, let's, we'll just put down roots here in A&M, right, in College Station. And um, the department that I had graduated with my master's degree from was, a, I think at the time, was Recreation Management and Youth Leadership. And in 2009, the college that they were in, unbeknownst to anybody except like the dean and the, you know, the administration was dissolved. And the, the departments were sort of distributed around the university to other colleges and the, the rec department moved over into the business school. And at first, I think that was just a surprise for everybody of like, what? Like, you know, like our college was disbanded and, you know, the, the deans in the business school were like, well, like recreation, how does this fit in? And so it was this really sort of like arranged marriage where neither side <laughs> was like, like, I think, uh, able to sort of understand like why this was happening. And so I'm sort of watching this from afar and I'm still doing research with, with faculty from my master's program and sort of hearing what they're doing and changes they're making and, you know, pros and cons. And so three years after that, I guess two years after that, they, they had an open position and they approached me and asked me to apply. And um, I had great relationships with that department. And, and I said, yeah, like I'll, I mean, at least sort of consider this and yeah, explore the opportunity. I think one of the, yeah, exactly. And um, even though I was super happy with, 
with things at um, A&M. But one of the things that I really love about academia is building stuff, right? Not like bridges, but like, <laughs> like you just get a like building new courses or building like research agendas. And, and so I, I love like new stuff. I, I often say that I'm distracted by all shiny objects, right? Like, oh, that looks interesting. And this is interesting too. And so the, the program was trying to evolve and take what they knew about um, how uh, uh, recreation and leisure impacted individuals and made people's lives better when, when uh, designed and participated in, in, in particular ways and said like, well, how can we, how can we sort of expand um, what we know into sort of these other spaces that, that we have access to being in a business school? Like what's the value added that we can bring to a business school? And so at th that point, they were sort of looking at, you know, expanding the focus to the experience industries, um, you know, really sort of leaning into stuff that Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore had written about in the experience economy. And we're just sort of started in this space of trying to figure out what this might look like. And for me, like my, my impetus for going in academia was experiences, like trying to understand experiences. And so this was really intriguing to me um, to be part of building something out like that. And, and ultimately that was, I mean, there's of course like the draw, like my family's from the West and we, and my family, my wife and my kids, we, we love to ski and we love the mountains and we love, so just like access to a little bit more geographic diversity, but from a professional perspective, it really was this opportunity to come in and help build out a program. And that's, that's what I've spent a lot of my time doing over the last, um, you know, nine years is helping, you know, this program evolve from a traditional recreation program into, you know, an experience design and management program where we now have students go into a variety of career paths, experience industries, yes, and also, as I mentioned earlier, customer experience, employee experience, product management. And what's been cool to me um, to see is just the, the applicability of understanding the the principles of of leisure and sort of the the social psych aspect of leisure and and how much that can inform um, the design of experiences in other spaces. And in fact, I I gave a Butler lecture at NRPA a couple of years ago that will come out in JLR sometime this year. And basically just sort of outlines sort of my story and also the evolution of our department and how I think it relates to sort of the evolution is the, of opportunities for evolution of the, of the field of um, leisure research in general, because I think there's a lot of questions to be answered um, in the world today that leisure scholars can play a more prominent role than they have in the past. I think COVID actually has, has um, it, like sped that up to a certain degree because we used to live in a world where our uh, professional and personal lives were really separated and and now everything's mashed together right technology was doing it already but covid did it to an even greater degree and so now it's not just how do i how do i design an employee experience and it's like nine to five and you know benefits and compensation packages no it's like employees want to know like well how like what do you do with like uh like remote work and i'm not just making a decision about um like how much i'm i want to get paid i'm also interested in culture and how does this sort of align with my sort of uh you know personal life and interests and and so i, I think there's just this this like great mashup happening and if and if you look back to like the origins of our field in the 60s it was this time when people were like, oh my goodness, like suddenly because of technological advancements, we're gonna be working less and we're gonna have more free time and people won't know what to do with it. And so we've got to, you know, all of these interdisciplinary uh, scholars came together to say, we need to understand like how to help people use their leisure time. Right. And I think the questions are a little bit different now, but I think answers that we've accumulated over the last, you know, number, you know five decades as a field um should be shared more broadly than we traditionally have i sort of went off script uh, <laughs> from your from your question no, that's fine. Uh, michael but yeah that's sort of 
that's sort of the 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 longer version of that story <laughs> no that's great um you know it I think it shows the, the passion that you bring to what you're doing there uh, at BYU, you know, like it shows that it's more, it, it, I don't know, it shows the passion and investment you have uh, at a deeper level. Um, you know, so one, so you're there, you're there at BYU, uh, back uh, home base is what I like to say, right? Um, yeah, yeah. What, so what, what are some of the things that you've done there? I, you, you talked about building a program, but could you tell us about a couple of experiences you've had that have really been feathers in your cap or something that you'll remember forever kind of thing? Yeah, man, I just, I, I love, I love my job. I love the, the life of an academic and the, just, just everything. I'm, I, I've always lived in college towns, right? Whether it's been here in Provo or in college stations, I just love the, the vibrancy of a, of a college town. And, and I think I, um, I love thinking about, I think, one, I mean, I, I enjoy my research. I enjoy, I really enjoy the classes that I teach, but I've, I've come to increasingly um, be focused on the overall student experience within an academic program, right? So as faculty members, I think it's really easy to become focused primarily on the course that you teach. And you might have some awareness of what other people teach in the department, um, and that depends from department to department. I know, and this is probably totally on me, but in A&M, you know, the courses I taught, I just, I, I didn't really think about much what the students had before they came to my class and what they were going to do after my class, right? It was just sort of surviving as a, as a new instructor, right? And like, hopefully they don't like find out that I really have no idea what I'm doing and <laughs> I can like make it through the semester, right? And, um, you know, increasingly, because you know, with my focus of my teaching and research on experience design and teaching about like designing, you know, customer journeys or whatever it might be, um, yeah, I, I think I just think more and more about like, okay, what what is what is the experience of students in our program feel like from the beginning to the end, right? From the time they're recruited um, uh, and decide to join the program to graduating and becoming an alum, right? And how can we just make that better? And I and and I think this speaks to, in my mind, also just the evolution of higher education, right? Like, again, pandemic I think has sped this up. But you know, as as a as an institute of higher education, we can't just expect to have faculty come into a classroom and tell students a bunch of stuff, right? Because they could just jump on YouTube and watch somebody more famous than us do the same thing in a lot of instances. And so I, I just I love thinking about okay how do we, how do we how do we connect um, the students' learning experiences across courses and make them feel more connected? How do we think about like what else do they need? Like you know as a as a you know I think universities are really good at sequencing curricular experiences and saying like oh you have to take this and then this and then this and then this and this is what you need to do to graduate, but. How can, we, how can we enrich sort of the extracurricular side too? not like take over students' lives, but make it just more harmonious saying like, oh, you're interested in this? Well, here's like join this professional organization or here's this like research assistantship opportunity or I think I think we've just got to think more holistically. And so um, I, I, I love um, just just thinking about sort of building out that student experience. And we were able to to leverage some funding um, last year to hire a chief student experience officer. So we have a staff position and, and her uh, role, her name's Ari Mateo and she's awesome, um, is just to, one, to continually be getting feedback from students and, and two, thinking about really being an advocate for students and saying, yeah, can we improve this? Here's something that students are saying. Can we make a tweak to this? How do we onboard students more? And so to me, it's just, it's really exciting to think about um, how you provide just this really more holistic student experience as opposed to where I started my career of like, here's my course, what am I doing today, et cetera, et cetera. So just just sort of stepping back and thinking about like, how do we do this this full student journey? Sure. I, you know, and I think that uh, something I've heard other people say is, yeah, I think about it as a kind of like an ongoing circular loop as far as the experience. It's not so much linear anymore. It's, you know, it's got more going on with it. 
Um, totally. Yeah. And, and that's real scientific, my loop there, right? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I think you're right. I think, you know, think, thinking about, uh, you know, beyond those borders of our classrooms and, uh, you know, you're not the only one that thought, you know, uh, you're you're not the first or the last to have that survival mechanism in the class, right? Because <laughs> I was oh, yeah. thinking like, that was me. <laughs> oh, it's still me sometimes. Yeah. Um, so before I, I, before I ask you the, the last question I do with these is, um, I was in, if you think about you, know, you and, you know, your, uh, what, what you like to do and all that kind of thing, and you think about if money wasn't an object, you know, like, whether you had money to pay the bills or, you know, if you, if you hit the lottery, so to speak, and you could do any job in the world, uh, like a dream job or whatever, whatever we want to call it. But if you could do anything in the world, uh, what would, uh, Matt Durden be doing for, uh, a job if it was a dream job? Um, I think I'd just be doing what I'm doing right now. Right. I just, I, I love it. I mean, I think one of the things that attracted me to an academic, um, career were questions, right? And the, the opportunity to answer questions and also um, having, I, I think the, the cool thing about an academic job and no job is perfect, right? And there's things that we don't, you know, that we don't, the, that you don't like in any job, even a dream job. But I love that I have a ton of autonomy, right? So no one's checking to see where I am, especially now with COVID, nobody knows where anybody is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, like no one, I don't have to clock in and clock out, right? Um, I've got autonomy to do my work where and how I would like to get it done. And as long as I get it done, like no no one asks me. And I, and I like what I do, so I get it done, right? I Like I, I do my work. Um, but, it, but you also have this like, um, you know, if you're able to get tenure, you've got this um, like security too, right? So it's almost like you're an entrepreneur, but you're not, um, having to wonder like if are you going to be able to make payroll this month right right uh, and there's of course like stresses of publication and all those other things that are involved um but i don't know i just like every day is different and there's so many opportunities um afforded to you at a university and each university is different and there's different opportunities i mean um like a, last year I was the co-director of BYU has a, a, a study, a residential study abroad center in London. And my neighbor is an English professor and he's like, hey, do you, should we apply? Like, and do sort of an interdisciplinary thing around experience design. And he does sort of urban design stuff. And so we spent, you know, part of the year in London and um, it was awesome, right? Like, so I just, I, I love what I do, right? There may be times when I'm grading a bunch of papers and I think like, okay, this isn't the greatest, but um, yeah, I, lo I love my job. I love like the, you know, the department and building stuff out and doing research, just a variety. I remember as, as an undergrad, I'm like, I, I, I don't know the job that I want, but I know what I want it to feel like, right? I want a lot of variety. I want to feel like I'm making an impact. I want to feel like I have a certain degree of autonomy and continually be learning. And so like academic job, like checks those boxes for me. So I'm super grateful for the opportunity to have the job that I have. No, it's, you know, and, you know, I have to echo a lot of what you said. It's, it, you know, so much of what you said is also what I love. Um, you know, that like, and you've described it perfectly, an entrepreneur where you're not having to worry about payroll, you know, and get involved in all these different things. And uh, I th something I like is, you know, while I have my main focus area, right, is if somebody says, hey, this is something I'm doing, would you be interested in, in helping? And even if it's not within that general area, I'm like, you know what, I've got the time sounds neat uh yeah right let's do it you know why not yeah so yeah like you seem like an interesting person to work with i mean i so my mark widmer uh who i who's, who's my colleague now but i always you know tease him that he's still my mentor because he is my thesis advisor but his his attitude is like i want to do uh cool projects with cool people in cool places right and I think, so i'll be like hey do you want to go present at this conference and he's like where is it? Is it in New Zealand? I'll go. So he <laughs> takes it to the extreme. He's like, oh, it's it's in the United States. No, I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> is there mountain biking there? Um, but but this idea of like, yeah, like I love my collaborators, right? This is like, these are people I like to hang out with yeah. just because I consider them to be friends and we get to do projects together. And like you said, you don't have to, 
just always stay sort of in this small box, right? I think you've got to be able to articulate like, oh, this project connects in this way and that way. But man, yeah, I like working with people all over the place and it's so, it's so fun. Well, uh, the last thing before I let you go uh, is, you know, for, for a student, a young professional, somebody getting their undergrad or master's degree or whatever it may be, and they're thinking about academic, uh, the academic route as far as a professional route um, within parks, recreation, leisure, experience design, all these things. Um, is, you know, do you have any uh, little bits of wisdom uh, or advice for somebody who's considering a path like that? You know, what I, and I don't know if this is probably not wisdom, but this is uh, what I share with uh, students. One, I always encourage students to consider grad school, regardless if that's a professional or academic track. I just think it, it, it expands your worldview. Um, your opportunities are going to be greater. And it's just interesting, right? Um, I think especially with an academic path, what will uh, sustain you is having good questions. So if you have questions you're really interested in, you'll be fine, right? Like you don't know stats, uh, you'll figure it out because you wanna be able to answer these questions or you, you're a slow reader, um, you'll get faster, right? As you have to read a bunch of stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people who have PhDs who are like super normal, like uh, myself. I can't speak for Michael, he's like, way cooler than me. But I mean, it's, I had questions that I was interested in. And so usually what I'll tell students is I'll, um, if they come to talk to me about grad school, I'll sort of give them like answer questions and things. And then I'll say, just start making a list of questions that you think would be interesting to ask and try to answer. And if you can come up with 50 pretty easily, like, and, and there's one, if you can do that, that's a, that's a good, um, indicator that you're a good question asker. And two, if you come up with 50, pretty guaranteed there's gonna be, you know, two or three or four or five that you'll find pretty compelling, right? Yeah. And and if you have a couple of questions that you think are really of interest to you, then uh, you'll really enjoy grad school because you'll just be getting tools to answer those questions. Well, something you mentioned too is, that, you know, um... You know, completely normal people having PhDs is, I, I, I like to remind my students, you know, like the, they'll be struggling in a class. I'm like, you know, it's okay to struggle. Um, it's okay to grow from that experience. And I tell them all the time, you know, like I, my undergrad experience wasn't great. Uh, it wasn't until grad school when I got my master's degree that I, that's when I really knew my path was a little bit more clear, you know? Mm -hmm. um, totally. Yep. So, and I tell, I tell students this all the time. I barely graduated. I graduated with almost a 3.0, you know, and, and I put the almost in there because I don't want to be very, very specific, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, in, in grad school, it, like you said, I encourage, I do the same thing. I'm like, go to grad school. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It can't do anything but help you in the future. And, but I yeah. also tell them, you know, that's, that's where you may find, you know, your next step and whatever that may be. So, yeah. And like your, your people, right? You'll find people right. who are interested in similar things that you are. And yeah, like grad, you know, undergrad is great. I'm all for like a liberal arts education. And I think it's really important to be exposed to a lot of stuff, but it's so nice when you get to grad school, it's like, now I was learning this. Now I'm just going to learn this much. Right. Right. And just focus in on that and everything's connected and you're, you're interacting with people who are interested in similar things that you're interested in. And it's just a cool, it's just a cool experience, right? It's not all peaches and cream, but it's it's it can be a really, really valuable thing. And there's not some, I think sometimes there's this perception of like, you know, to your point, I've got to be like the all-star student or I've got to just be this genius in something already. And I, you just have to be able to work hard. Right. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot of normal people with PhDs. Well, you know, that's another, I share with students and other people too, is I'd rather work with somebody who's, uh, you know, got the willingness and the, the forthright to keep at it versus somebody who's super smart. Uh, and yeah. super smart people are needed, uh, you know, uh, absolutely. But I, in my experience is, uh, you know, it just takes work. So much of what we do just takes effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. definitely. Yeah, just consistent, consistent. It's like a marathon. You're just sort of, Putting in, putting in work each day. It's not like you have some eureka moment and right. that is like defines your career, I think for most people. 
Well, Dr. Durden, thank you so much for taking time this morning uh, to, to share your story with us. Um, within the, when I put the video up, uh, if, if it's okay, I'd like to put a, a link to your program there, BYU. Um, sure. So yeah. Check that out. And because uh, you talked about that, and I think there's a lot more to uncover there with that program. It sounds really awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to link that. You can link my LinkedIn profile. That way, you know, if students have questions, they can just message me. I pay attention to that or my email or whatever. So I'd be happy to chat with cool. uh, students. So I think, think oh. this is a great series you're putting together. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and if nothing else, uh, have a great summer. And uh, yeah, likewise. We'll talk soon. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye bye.